have great pleasure in welcoming all of you to the event tonight, and the event is Immunity and Harnessing the Power and Specificity of the Immune System to Beat Killer Diseases, a three-part sampler of research in the Melbourne Biomedical Precinct. And with that, I'll hand it over to my co-MC, Sammy Badui, who will introduce the speakers and the event. Thank you. Okay. So coinciding with the National Science Week, um, the immunological focus of the world is facing or is heading towards Melbourne in the next week. So Melbourne is hosting the International Congress of Immunology, which brings a lot of immunologists from across the world um, all the way to Melbourne. We thought that that was a nice opportunity to highlight some of the immunological research that is currently being conducted, not only here in this building, but in the precinct here in Parkment, uh, Parkville in general. So you will hear from three terrific speakers um, reporting on their research, on their ongoing research, on trying to understand how to improve immunity in the context of virus infections, or also to improve control or maybe even prevention of cancers. And you will also hear from a speaker dedic that dedicated most of his career on understanding, on trying to understand how to dampen immune responses when they have come, gone out of control. But before we get to these talks, it's a tremendous pleasure to introduce Nobel laureate uh, Professor Doherty. Obviously, you all know that this building is named after Peter. So Peter has made stellar achievements over a long and a distinguished career. And he's still going strong here in the Institute. Uh, in 1996, now 20 years ago, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics, uh, Physiology and Medicine. <laughs> of course, that one too. That's coming. Yeah, that's and I think until today, he's still the only veterinarian that has received this honor. And uh, I took the liberty of watching the Nobel uh, lecture this morning. He's probably also the only one that um, was making jokes about his co-awardee being a Swiss spy in that lecture <laughs> and some jokes on sheep which I'm not going to go into. <laughs> the most important bit is the discovery that Rolf Zinkernagel and Peter Doherty made at the time clarified a really important aspect of immunity, namely that T cells recognize infected cells and that they do so in direct contact. So many of the discoveries that are being made now possible really are based on Peter's discovery and Rolf's discovery in the context of, of um, these findings. Now, these findings made in 1973 to 1975, which is 1974, beautiful year, um, were in a line with a lot of different, very major discoveries. And sometimes people like that are active today would probably argue maybe all the big discoveries have been made, and for us it's now to mess, um, uh, make sense out of the mess that's in between. But it's probably not the case, as shown by the recent success, for example, in immunotherapy and the re-adventure or reinvigoration of TISA immunotherapy. And uh, Peter put it very eloquently in one of his reviews that maybe the mind is only what keeps us back from truly understanding what immunity is and how immunity works. But I think we probably have still a lot of capacity there before we hit that ceiling that Peter has said. So without further ado, I invite Peter to um, Give us an introduction into the immune system. Um, so, yeah, I don't remember the joke about sheep that could well have involved New Zealand. Um, it's, uh, and actually, the only other time I've heard someone give a Nobel lecture, the guys were, was Tim Hunt, and uh, who got into a lot of trouble not so long back, and, and his, his group, and that, they were actually very funny. So a Nobel le lectures are not all totally stiff and formal, and you can look them up online. If you go to the Nobel website, you can see all the Nobel lectures that have been uh, done since the days of recording. You can't get back to the early ones, of course, because they weren't around. Um, so I'm just going to give some introductory remarks. Um, that's basically a definition of immunity. It's, it's, it's a balanced system. I mean, it's a system that has to deal with, with non-self or foreignness and, and uh, infection, uh, cancer, and, and uh, on, on, the, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's got to avoid attacking us. And sometimes it gets it wrong, and uh, that happens. So you're going to hear from three different speakers. Uh, Catherine is kind of continuing uh, the kind of tradition that I was involved in. Catherine 
uh, works in the group, our influenza immunity group, and she's emerged as a very strong investigator. She works with, uh, principally now, she works with humans, and uh, she also works with clinical material. Um, Catherine's background is in, in basic science, and uh, like Sammy and, and Dale. Uh, but we've also got two real medical doctors here. We've got Len, who works on autoimmunity when the immune system goes wrong and starts to attack us, and how you try and do something about that. Len's at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, where he's been for many, many years. And then we've got Joe Trapani, who's uh, also uh, a physician by a clinician by training, uh, and is now at the new um, Cancer Institute across the street, this wonderful new building that anyone who's a historic uh, Melbourne type remembers as the dental school. Uh, it was a very drab, uh, drab sort of uh, dilapidated place when I first got here because they just moved out, and now we've got this really fantastic new building with two very good coffee shops, and so we're all very grateful. <laughs> and, and it's great to have the Peter Mac people here because there's so much complementarity in the types of research that we do and the types of technologies we use. If anyone hasn't realised it, this precinct here at the University of Melbourne is becoming, or is, the, the most powerful research, biomedical research precinct in Melbourne, uh, in Australia, really. And uh, of course, Monash also has a very, uh, very major research effort. And this, we've just announced there's going to be even closer linkages between Monash and Melbourne. The really great thing about Melbourne as a research city is that we work very well together across the various institutions. Melbourne's of uh, Victoria. Melbourne is a very, I think, collegial and cooperative city. Uh, I think uh, someone's explained it by the fact that everyone plays AF4 football and we all speak the same football code. If you come from Brisbane, as I do, uh, the, the, the plebes all play rugby league, the knobs all play rugby union and they don't talk to each other, which is why you don't want to go and live in Brisbane. It's um, for uh, many other reasons too. But still. Now, to me at least, in, uh, the immune system really evolved over a very long period to deal with the challenge of infection. Uh, we're slowly reproducing long-lived organisms. We can change very slowly in a mutational sense, whereas microorganisms can change with enormous rapidity. Not only that, they replicate very, very quickly, and they're coming out of nature at us all the time. We're constantly getting new infections uh, emerging, and uh, we're getting very accustomed to that. And also, we, we, we've ramped up that rate of emergency by our enormous increase in human population. You know, the human population since 1800 has increased by a factor of seven. It's increased by a factor of about two and a half times in my lifetime. That's putting enormous pressure on the planet, uh, putting enormous pressure on other species, leading to a lot of land clearance and all the rest of it. And we're seeing many of these infections that are emerging as being uh, really uh, unknown previously and now being quite substantial. And of course, modern air travel moves these infections around the world very, very quickly. Influenza, for instance, which is a respiratory infection, uh, and we're infectious before we realise so we're actually suffering from the disease, uh, travels enormously fast by air. It's, uh, it travels because uh, infected people travel. They travel before they realise they're sick. They're coughing and spluttering the virus. And with the 2009 uh, influenza swine flu pandemic that you may remember, the virus was certainly in Australia by the time it was first detected in California and New Mexico. It really happened very, very quickly indeed. And those viruses go around the world very fast indeed. Uh, there are other viruses on the move. Zika virus we've all heard about recently. It's been in the Pacific for quite a while, but it's moved across from Africa, across the Indian Ocean, into the Pacific Islands, and then into South America, and now into North America. And uh, we're all waiting to see where that goes. Now, the immune system is there, basically uh, has evolved really to deal with that problem. At least that's the way we see it. It doesn't mean it's necessarily so. It could be that there's other reasons that have driven it. And we're realising increasingly that some forms of cancer are under immune control and fairly effectively under immune control. And one of the big breakthroughs recently is in our understanding of how we can unleash those responses. And I think Joe's going to tell us something about that. Now, the word immunity comes from the Latin immunus, which means without tax. 
So it was taken by the immunologists because what we're talking about is a system that relieves the tax of infection. So it's like, uh, you know, like the Republicans in the United States, we don't want to pay tax. And so people in the genio immunium were soldiers who'd returned from the wars, they were legionnaires, who'd come back from the Roman wars, and for a time they were exempt from tax, and thus the term immunity. It's all, all forms of immunity are mediated essentially uh, via the white blood cells and their secreted products. Um, there are two aspects to the immune system. There's the innate immune system. Dale works on that and, uh, and uh, does interesting, uh, interesting things that I partly understand. And, uh, and it's very old. It goes right back in, in biology. It goes back to the earliest, even to single cell organisms. You think of phagocytosis as part of immunity. Um, we find genes that are shared really between us and fruit fly. For instance, the toll-like receptors that are involved in the natural killer cells, which are a part of that system. So it's a very old system. It's essentially a system which is our early response. This is the way we deal with an infection early on very quickly, and we can seek to limit it. Without that innate immune system, we would rapidly, for example, become over overwhelmed by bacterial infections, molecules called the defense are enormously important. In virus infections, it's the type 1 interferons that are tremendously important, and so on. So there, there are various molecules that uh, turn on very fast. Sometimes that system, though, can be over-effulgent. It can be too much, and we get what's called a cytokine storm. The cytokines are these molecules, these, in some cases, quite toxic molecules that are produced by these innate immune cells, and they can cause massive vascular leakage, and people, for example, can drown in their own, own lung fluid because of the leakage. Uh, systemic shock is the, uh, is the type, of, type of disease we're thinking of there. Then we have the adaptive immune system. This is a system that I've studied all my career, and it's basically about 350, 400 million years old. We first see it clearly in, uh, in, in phylogeny in, in the bony fish. It, uh, there's, there's, there's elements in the lampreys, as, uh, as uh, 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 ha has been studied more recently, but we really first see the characteristics of specificity and of immunological memory that, uh, and, and this absolutely specific targeting to particular pathogens. We're all familiar with the fact that if you're vaccinated against measles, that doesn't make you immune to polio. And so the specificity and memory are the key characteristics of the adaptive immune system. And as I said, all immunity is basically mediated by the white blood cells and their products. Uh, we have the antibody system, which is mediated by the antibody molecules that are secreted by cells in what we call the B cell lineage. Uh, these and the plasma cells. These uh, molecules are in the blood. They float around in the blood. They can be there in the very, very long term. And they're what, pre what they're essentially the basis of our vaccines, the production of antibodies that recirculate in the long term. That type of response can last pretty much for the life of an individual. We know some of this from, uh, for instance, vaccinating people against yellow fever. We use a live attenuated vaccine to vaccinate against yellow fever. And, yellow, and, and then, of course, people don't contact yellow fever virus unless they go to West Africa and they get bitten by a mosquito. So nobody in the Western world will normally contact yellow fever virus, but they can have antibodies antibodies to yellow fever virus and cells that can produce antibodies to yellow fever virus for the rest of their life. So immunological memory can be very, very long term indeed. And much the same is true of the T cells, uh, the, the, uh, the cell mediated system that I'll say a bit about later. So, uh, and of course the, the immune system, interestingly, the, the cell uh, that is the basis of immunity is the white blood cell or the lymphocyte. Uh, though we knew about red cells from about the 17th century because of the work of Leeuwenhoek when he first developed very tiny microscopes, uh, we didn't know about the white blood cells until the 1840s. It's interesting that if you go back to sort of Lady Macbeth trying to wash the blood off her hands, or even if you go back to Harvey who worked out the circulation of the blood, 
Nobody knew why blood was red until Leeuwenhoek came along and showed red blood cells down his very, very simple microscopes. They were just single, tiny little things with just single lenses, but made very well. And he could actually see the red blood cells in blood, say, rushing through uh, the, the toe uh, veins of, of, of a toad or a frog or something like that. But he didn't see the white blood cells because they were very rare. If you go back to some of Leeuwenhoek's dried preparations, evidently, in, in at least one of them, there is a white blood cell there. And it's thought it's a bit of, uh, bit of, bit of Leeuwenhoek's snot that dried on the side when he had a cold. <laughs> now, through the 19th century, we worked out the red blood cells. The reason the, red, white blood cells, the white blood cells were seen was because we got better microscopes. It was as simple as that. Once people started to look with better microscopes, they realised that the, the, there were white blood cells that at very low frequency uh, were present in blood. Um, many of them were worked out through the 19th century because uh, Pearl Ehrlich and the German dye industry uh, some of these dyes were actually used for therapy, but they also learned how to stain cells and stain tissue. And when you stained them, you could see there's a diversity of types of white blood cells. They look quite different and they have different functions. The one cell that didn't get worked out, most of them was kind of known early in the 20th century, really quite early. And uh, we get a Nobel Prize to Eli Metchnikoff very early on for working out the phagocytic cell, the macrophage. But by the Till the 1950s, we didn't know what the small white blood cell, the lymphocyte, which is a very prevalent white blood cell, actually did. And that was worked out by uh, Jim Gowans. And again, like much of the advance in science, it was worked out by an advance in technology. And that is that Gowans, people were draining lymphocytes out of the lymphatic system in rats. And, what and they came to all the wrong conclusions, actually. They came to the conclusions that the white blood cells were forming the bone marrow cells which gave rise to the blood. But what Gowans did is he used a new te technique called adoradiography. He labelled the white blood cells or the lymphocytes with iodine, uh, radioactive iodine, injected them back in and then looked for them in the tissues. And he found out that these blood cells go back into the lymph nodes. And then he started to see that they were expanding in numbers when you developed an immune response. And we started to understand how the immune system works. Uh, then Jacques Miller came along and he discovered the role of the thymus in the neck, which gives the T cells. Miller and Gowans should uh, really have got a Nobel Prize, and, uh, but they didn't. And uh, often people miss out on Nobel Prizes. And, uh, you're kind of lucky if you get one of these things. Don't turn it down if they offer it to you. <laughs> um, so the antibody molecules, antibody molecules on the whole uh, bind to tertiary structures on protein. Uh, and so they're, they're complex folder determinants, not invariably, but our protective antibodies tend to bind to uh, uh, these complex uh, uh, folded forms. Uh, and Understanding that was one of the things that actually led to some of the first designer drugs. This is actually, a, there was a co-crystal made of an antibody with the neuraminidase protein of influenza virus, which is one of the surface proteins of influenza. It was done by Peter Coleman, who's currently at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And when they understood the structure of how these two things bind together, they were able then to develop uh, Mark von Itstein, who was then at Monash Pharmacy College, developed a small molecule that could interfere with this process. And that's the drug uh, Rolenza and uh, the first antiviral, really, for, for influenza. And of course, antivirals have been tremendously important, not so much in influenza, where you have to catch the infection very early, but antiviral drugs are massively uh, are what has kept HIV AIDS in check. You have to give a cocktail of three so the, uh, the, the virus doesn't mutate away. All our vaccines, pretty much, are based on the antibody response. All our successful vaccines are based on antibody responses. Uh, some uh, viruses we've got, um, some pathogens and some toxins, we've got very good vaccines. Some we haven't. We need much better vaccines for influenza, and that's one of the things we're working on here. And of course, we've failed totally so far to develop a vaccine against HIV AIDS. There's a lot of work going on in both influenza and in HIV, trying to develop antibody responses against cross-reactive parts of the molecules that are on the cell surface. But so far, we, we haven't worked out how to make a vaccine that makes those antibody responses. And there's also a lingering concern that if we make those responses, they may be auto-reactive and we may be triggering autoimmune responses. So anything like this has to be very, very thoroughly tested and looked at very carefully. Um, 
We also have a problem with vaccination. That is uh, not that, uh, that we can't make the vaccines, but a lot of people are, uh, are rejecting vaccination for their kids. It's not too terrible in, the, in Australia. We, uh, we, I think we're getting over a 90% vaccination rate since the government legislated that if you don't vaccinate your kids, you don't get child support payments. That's been pretty successful. And, uh, but still, I, I was talking to a physician from one of the eastern suburbs uh, on the weekend, and she says she's still seeing these well-to-do mothers who will rush to the clinic whenever their kid gets a sniffle, uh, but they won't vaccinate their kids against whooping cough, which is a hideous disease that can kill the kid and give long-term serious consequences. She refers to them as her yummy mummies, and I don't think she's being affectionate. Um, so... Then there's the other part of the immune response, not the antibodies. There's the part where there are cells in our body that kill other cells. This was discovered back in the 1950s for the first time. We didn't realise that we actually have killer cells floating around in our own body. These are cells that bump off, and particularly they bump off virus-infected cells. Viruses grow within cells. Any virus-infected cells are factory-producing more virus. If you don't get rid of those cells, they're going to kill, they're going to infect more cells, and we're going to get a spreading infection. And so these are a bit like the Legionnaire too, in the sense that they have to make contact. You know, the legionnaire fought with a very short sword called the gladius. They had these big, big uh, shields up and these killer T-cells don't kill each other. And what they did is uh, when people got too close with their big broadswords, they say, well, they just poked them in the tummy like that from behind the big shield. And it was a very effective way of getting rid of people. And so the, the Roman legions were very successful. And they got to go home and be retired. And uh, this is, uh, I'm, just, I'm just going to finish by showing you, Catherine's, I'm sure, going to talk about killer T cells. I'm going to show you one at work. Now, that big cell on the, on the, on the, on the thing is possibly a virus-infected cell. The green cell is one of these killer T cells. And you see it's going to kill it. And this is a photo by M Misty Jenkins, who was in our lab and is now across the street at the Hall Institute. And you can see that cell's very dead. So on death, I'm going to hand over to Catherine and let her talk. So. Thanks very much, Peter. That was a wonderful introduction to the rest of the uh, session. And the next speaker I'd like to introduce is Associate Professor Catherine Kudzierska, who works at the University of Melbourne right here in the Doherty Institute upstairs. So just a, a brief little intro about Catherine. Catherine is the head of the Human T-Cell Laboratory at the University of Melbourne's Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Her principal area of expertise is viral immunology. And as an NHMRC CDRF2 fellow, Catherine established her independent research on universal immunity to human influenza viruses. In addition, Catherine is also an adjunct professor at Fudan University in Shanghai, China, and a co-director of the Sino-Australian Joint Research Laboratory for Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Disease Research, Fudan Melbourne University, which is located at the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Centre. And Catherine is also the reigning Australian Academy of Sciences Jacques Miller Medalist for Experimental Medicine. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Dale, for the introduction and invitation. It's always a great pleasure to participate in the Sci um, National Science Week activities. So as Dale um, mentioned, we are interested in immunity to influenza viruses, as influenza presents three global health challenges. The first one, as you know, they are our, um, the, the um, seasonal epidemics, um, causing significant morbidity and mortality, predominantly in children and the elderly. Then when a new virus resorts, we can have an outbreak of an influenza pandemic, and um, when, and then we see deaths of young and previously healthy individuals. Influenza also circulates in domestic animals, uh, causing illness and culling of birds. Um, as Peter mentioned, influenza is rapidly spreading and can go through a country like um, the United States in um, seven weeks. And the spread is even more rapid when we have an outbreak of a pandemic virus. In 2009, the virus was found in 74 countries in just under um, two months. When we have an influenza pandemic, it can lead to millions of deaths, as it was seen, uh, as it happened. Um, during the catastrophic Spanish influenza, 
And especially at the beginning of an influenza pandemic, there's lots of panic associated with the new virus, as we've seen in 2009 during the swine pandemic. So we are interested in the killer CD8 T cells as in contrast to the antibodies that provide specific strain-specific immunity. CD8 T cells recognize peptides that are derived from the internal, more conserved parts of the virus, and um, in that way can provide us protection across distinct influenza strains and subtypes, including the seasonal pandemic and the newly emerging influenza viruses um, that come from um, animals. And today I'm going to present you some of our recent work on immunity to the new um, H7N9 influenza virus that um, emerged in China in 2013 and um, it's capable of infecting humans. Um, H7 and 9 is a triple resortant of um, H7 and 3, uh, H7 and 9, and H9 and 2 viruses that circulate in birds and um, in birds in China and um, uh, Korea. Um, the, the, this was the first time that we've seen the virus in the human circulation. Um, and um, the virus causes severe um, disease in humans. Uh, the mortality rates are 40%, hospitalization rates are 99%. Um, so there are quite a few concerns about this new avian influenza virus. Um, as this is the first time we're seeing the virus in the human circulation, um, nobody's got um, any neutralizing antibodies to the virus. Um, the virus is well established in birth. However, it causes only a mild disease in birds, so we do not know which birds are sick, which birds need to be culled. And uh, for now, the transmission is only birds to humans, but obviously um, there is a possibility that the virus can mutate and acquire human-to-human -human transmission. So obviously it is important how we can control um, this new avian h 7 9 influenza. So the first question um, that we asked was if at um, the population level we do not have any antibody um, uh, responses, um, do we have any pre-existing uh, killer CD8 T cell immunity that could give us some protection against the new avian virus? In other words, whether the CD8 T cells that we acquired by um, being infected with seasonal influenza viruses can recognize the, um, the new h 7 n 9 virus. And in summary, the answer was yes. Uh, we, we found that we have um, pre-existing CD8 T cell immunity to the new avian h 7 n 9 influenza virus. However, the level varied across ethnicities. The coverage of um, different T cell specific specificities was between 16 and 56 uh, percent, 56 in cohesion, cohesions and 16 in indigenous people. However, the more important question was, as 99% um, of people uh, infected with H7N9 were hospitalized with severe influenza disease, was, uh, so the question was um, whether those CD8 T cells did anything in those patients. <coughs> So to answer uh, that question, we established um, a great collaboration with Professor Jiantin Xu uh, from the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center. And um, the collaboration was really facilitated uh, by Zhang Fang, a fantastic postdoctoral fellow in my lab, who then, together with Sergio during his PhD, went to Shanghai and worked together with Professor Xu's people um, in the PC4 laboratory um, to answer some of those questions. So during the first wave of H7 and 9 outbreak uh, in um, the Shanghai hospital, they had 18 patients. Uh, 12 of them survived, six of them died. Um, they took blood samples every two to three days. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, these are the only longitudinal samples um, in, in China. So as those samples were really unique, we worked hard to establish assays um, that could give us lots of answers from small volumes of blood. And the assay that um, we started with was we used a small number of cells infected with the H7N9 virus under the PC4 conditions. 
um, and after 19 hours, look at uh, activation of those cells specificity um, by um, inter, uh, intracellular cytokine assay, and we look at um, quite a few um, cellular responses. Um, so in summary, what we found was that it's really the nature of um, the immune response that was associated, that drove um, the, um, the outcome of the disease and the length of the disease. So patients with um, most rapid recovery, um, they had the early, um, the early peak of um, CD, those killer CD8 T cells. Um, and they, they recovered from the severe influenza um, rapidly, and that was followed by CD4s and NK cells. None of the other patients group had those early CD80 cell responses. Patients that stayed in the hospital for longer, um, for even more than a month, had delayed um, CD80 cell responses, and they were helped by um, CD40 cells and NK cells. Uh, but what was striking is that patients that died, they had no cellular responses at any stage of the disease. So two main questions emerged from those findings. And these were, um, how can we establish um, such prominent CD80 cell pools in everyone so they can get activated when we get uh, infected with influenza viruses? And what happened to those patients that died? They, they didn't have any um, immunity at any time point. So to answer that question, we uh, perform microarray analysis at two different time points, um, early in the infection, and we call it R1D1, recovery group and death group at the early time point. And that was at the time point that all the patients looked the same to cl the clinicians. The clinicians had no way of predicting, predicting which people will die or, survived, or survive. And uh, the second time point, late time point, R2D2, recover, late recovery and uh, late um, death group. So firstly, looking at the comparison, uh, the later time point, um, the results were quite striking and we found global differences in transcriptomes between patients that survived and or died. And um, close to 20,000 um, genes were differentially um, expressed. Um, and if you, if you look here at the CAC pathway, um, it was mainly due to the enrichment of genes, immune genes across um, all the immune pathways in the patients that survived comparing to those that died. However, really interesting results were when we compare patients at the early time point after, um, after they um, came to the hospital and when Mike Iannui um, did very stringent um, analysis for us, we found that there were only four um, genes differentially expressed and, and they were differentially expressed by uh, multiple probes. So now we're pursuing those genes, genes with a view that uh, they could be early diagnostic markers uh, as, and predictors of a clinical outcome of um, severe influenza infection. So as we, we didn't see any activation interferon gamma production in patients that died, we asked the question whether there was a total lack of CD8 T cell activation in patients uh, with uh, fatal outcomes from the severe H7 and 9 disease. And um, we looked at a number of activation markers and really interesting results um, came out when we looked at um, the CD38 HLA-DR expression. And CD38 HLA-DR um, are considered um, to be one of top markers for CD80 cell activation to viral infection. And here we're looking at the representative patient that uh, recovered from H7-9 or died. And just to remind you, um, while we saw induction in interferon gamma production in patients that recovered, there was nothing in patients that died. And uh, looking at HLA-DRCD38, as expected, we saw um, nice populations in patients that recovered. However, very surprising results were that we saw massive and prolonged um, CD38 HLA-DR HLA expression in patients that actually died. 
uh, from severe influenza infection. And here you can see a summary of all the patients that um, we looked at. In red, we, you can see the prolonged activation level uh, in patients that um, died versus um, patients that survived. They start high and then when they recover, um, the activation markers go down. So um, as we didn't see any interferon gamma production, but CD8 T cells were activated, that made us think maybe those cells were exhausted. So we looked at the um, expression of um, the exhaustion marker PD-1. And again, we're looking at here at the representative patient that recovered versus died. And uh, we gated on CD48 HLA-DR in red and the remaining cells in blue. And while in the patient that recovered, you can see what we call an intermediate expression of PD-1. And um, there have been studies, this is linked to TCA activation. In patients that died, we can see, uh, especially at um, the, um, later time points, um, we can see a high level of uh, PD-1 expression, which probably reflects um, exhaustion of those cells as um, those patients um, had um, um, more um, viral load for longer time points. And we've previously shown that um, the patients that died had more virus for longer time points and higher inflammation level. So that led us um, to the hypothesis that maybe in patients that died and had more um, antigen for longer time points and more inflammation, maybe what we, we saw within those um, activated CD8 T cells was just a recruitment of non-specific by standard um, T cells. Um, because of the high inflammation and activation level in contrast to patients that survived that had recruitment of highly specific um, CD8 T cells. And to test that, we, um, we did the staining for HLA-DR CD38, single cell sorted the cells, and performed multiplex RT-PCR. Um, and um, in this study, we had close to 1,000 TCA alpha beta pairs. And I, I obviously don't have um, the time today to show you all of those results, but um, just quickly, I'll tell you what we think um, we see. Um, so in patients that um, recovered from severe avian influenza, um, we see uh, early induction of interferon gamma associated with early induction of CD48, HLA-DR, and PD-1. And from the early time points, we see large expansion of flu-specific CD8 T cells. And uh, from HLA-8 to people, we know these are flu-specific cells. And those large exp clonal expansions are stable throughout the time points, and then the frequencies go down as um, the antigen um, goes down. Then in contrast, in patients that died and had prolonged viral load, prolonged inflammation, we see a total shutdown of interferon gamma, prolonged CD38, HLA-DR, and PD-1 expression. And what we see with TCR clones, it's, they're not totally random. There are some common um, TCR um, biases there, but what's happening is um, we see a constant remodeling of TCR repertoire. It's like those patients were constantly looking for best fit TCRs um, to, to fight the infection and kill virally infected T cells. So um, thinking about the universal influenza vaccine, what we really want to establish is those um, high, uh, those expanded, those prominent CD T cell clones that after infection um, can um, get recruited into um, influenza infection and provide us a broad protection against different influenza strains. And at present, CD8 T cells can only be elicited pretty much by an influenza infection as the current um, influenza inactivated vaccine, while being fantastic at um, eliciting uh, influenza-specific B cells, plasma blasts, and follicular T cells, it doesn't elicit cellular immunity 
um, including um, T cells. So um, this is the challenge for the future influenza vaccine, not only to elicit um, B cells, um, which um, are strain specific, but also cellular immunity. And also um, what I think is really exciting from our studies is that um, now we have some level of understanding how different immune responses work together to fight, to fight a viral infection. And uh, we established a number of um, really nice assays um, to understand immunity to viral infection, that uh, infections that can be applicable to other newly emerging diseases. And um, being positioned here at the Dorothy Institute, uh, we, we can work together with um, the clinicians, epidemiologists, and um, diagnostic laboratories to understand immunity to newly emerging um, viruses. And similarly, as um, recovery from influenza induced acute pneumonia, severe acute pneumonia would be one of the prime examples of the effectiveness of our immune system and understanding how our immune system succeeds or fails is applicable to other um, diseases as cancer and immunity. So I think these are really exciting times for us immunologists in the Parkfield precinct and, and we can uh, work together to answer some common key questions related to important human diseases. So I just to acknowledge everyone in my group, I'm really privileged to work with a talented group of people, and especially Jean Fang, who really drove the H7 and 9 study, and then Sergio joined him twice in China. Um, Lian, Wan, Bridie, and Sniha were also involved. Um, Wan and Marius for driving the vaccine work, together with Adam and Steven. Uh, Peter for being a fantastic mentor, and um, Jan Tin Shu and his team for collaborating with us and NHMRC University of Melbourne for funding. Thank you.